Hello, everyone. Welcome back to our series on key battles of World War I. We're taking a step away from the key battles. We're taking a step away from the 10,000-mile satellite orbit view of everything that's going on with empires and nation states and movements of hundreds of thousands of troops. And we're going to zero in on the experiences of the individual soldier. And in the next episode, we're going to look at what it was like actually being in the trenches. Spoiler alert, it was not pleasant. So um, before we get into this, uh, I want to mention a few things about class divisions. But um, James and I were talking about some of our favorite films on the experiences of World War I soldiers because that was a common motif in the Civil War series where James, uh, every time he mentioned a Civil War film, we had to take a drink. <laughs> I don't know if we'll do as much on this uh, World War I, but there's a great film that I would recommend called They Shall Not Grow Old by Peter Jackson where it's not really a narrative of any particular battle, but it's footage of World War I, which when we normally see it, it looks sped up and choppy and a little bit strange for our modern eyes. But the speed is slowed down to look like a normal film. It's colorized, and there are lip readers who actually say what the soldiers are saying, and they add sound effects, so it feels like you're transported back in time. So pretty cool. Uh, you would give your thumbs up to that one also, James? Yeah, everything they say is they interviewed a lot of veterans from the war, you know, many years ago when there were still quite a few alive. And, and they pretty much tell the story. If you want to know what it's like to be a soldier down there in the trenches and on the battlefield, that you could do no better than to watch that uh, movie. It's absolutely wonderful. So, yeah, that is a great companion piece to this episode if you want to go out and find something. So we're going to look at the individual soldiers or uniforms and gear from different nation states. I'll just mention one thing before James carries us uh, with the narrative that World War I is still at a period where there is significant class division in Europe. Class really means something, being born upper class and aristocrat versus not. And almost all of the officers, especially if we look at a case like England, came from upper and middle classes. And uh, Britain's public schools and universities were the main recruiting grounds for new leaders to manage hundreds of thousands of new soldiers. So they were taught to control and care for men and how to command them and get their respect. But it was a strange dynamic because the most junior infantry officers, which were second lieutenants, were usually only teenagers. And they had to lead a platoon of around 30 men. A lot of enlisted soldiers were usually from tougher backgrounds. They weren't as educated. A number of them were much older. So there's, in addition to the challenges of the war itself, a lot of uh, class conflicts happening and many other things. But anyway, I figure we should just jump right into it. So James, kick us off. Tell us about the equipping of soldiers from different nations. I will. Before I do that, let me give a shout out to a wonderful YouTube video series that I used. I relied on, upon pretty heavily for this these details about uniforms of the different nations and equipment. It's called the great war and it's, it's an amazing YouTube channel. It has five or 600 total videos. I didn't watch all five or 600, but I watched probably 300 in preparing for this over a several month period. And they started it in 19, uh, no, sorry, in 1914. Yeah. This secret YouTube technology they had back then. <laughs> they started it in 2014 on the 100th anniversary of the outbreak of the war. And they did a week by week account. And they just told you what happened in the previous week. Every week they came out with a new episode and they would say, well, this week on the Western front, this happened and on the Eastern front, this happened and so on. And then they had special episodes on everything you can imagine from food to uniforms to gear to specific individuals to things like pets in World War I to things like technology. So it was a big help to me in preparing this series. So shout out if y'all when y'all finish this series and if you really want to get deep into World War One, then I highly recommend the Great War YouTube channel. I'm it watching if you watched every one of those episodes, it would probably be about like reading a two thousand page book <laughs> or something. I don't know, maybe more. But anyway, so we're going to start with the British, and that's probably because they're one of the ones we know the best and we're maybe the most publicized. The average British soldier was about five foot five inches, so not a big guy, about 112 pounds, and the average age was about 30. How did, what did they wear into combat? They started with a woolen undershirt, woolen underpants, and that would be like over the, 
you know, the tidy whiteies or whatever they call the boxers. Uh, and they had wool socks. So wool was a major part of the uniform. Over the, the undergarments, they would wear woolen khaki trousers with suspenders, and then they would wear a tunic with a fold-down collar or sometimes a stiff collar, but usually a fold-down collar. Different branches were slightly different things. And in warmer climates, they often just tossed the tunics and didn't wear them. So we're talking not that different from what was worn in the Civil War. I mean, wool, wool, wool. <laughs> so uh, it was got really hot in the summer, and you would sweat like crazy, but it also breathed well and and, and would cool down pretty quickly uh, when you had it sweaty. But it also kept you fairly warm in the winter. So it was a pretty flexible fabric. Now, most of them in the British Army wore ankle boots. They called them ammunition boots, and they had hobnailed soles. And then the, what they wore, uh, you've probably seen this if you've ever seen a World War I movie that featured the British. They wore little strips of cloth that they wound about the ankle and the calf, and those are called putties. And... Uh, they they look like bandages basically, and they provided ankle support. They kept the legs dry, and they kept mud and other things from getting into the boots, at least usually. And interestingly enough, they were the largest textile order of the war. Eight hundred fifty-two miles total <laughs> of putties were ordered. Does so, that stretch from the western to eastern front? I wonder. <laughs> yeah, maybe it would definitely go up and down the line of the western front, but easily but uh and those are going to be influential and other nations are going to eventually adopt those too now at the beginning of the war they did not wear any kind of helmet they just wore cloth trench caps uh we talked earlier in, in another episode about how you're always fighting the last war well in, in, in some ways they're dressed for the last war at least some more than others but almost nobody had well nobody did nobody had steel helmets at the beginning and they realized very quickly that a cloth a cap does not stop pieces of shrapnel from coming down and cutting your head open. So they were replaced in 1915 with the steel Brody helmet. And those were modeled after medieval English helmets, interestingly enough. And those are the ones that look like, I don't know, kind of like a saucer almost, a bowl with a, <laughs> a big wide brim. Uh, they did not cover the neck. So that was kind of a weakness. And the, uh, you know, the color... I think I mentioned this earlier, the color of the uniform was khaki. So the British were ahead of their time in that regard. They realized that that was pretty good camouflage. It blended in with dirt and mud, which the Western Front was mainly mud <laughs> a lot of the time. Uh, but uh, the helmets would be painted a drab khaki or, or they would put a cloth covering over them so that they didn't shine and give away, uh, you know, it was kind of a form of camouflage. In warmer climates, soldiers wore a different helmet made of cork and cloth, like if they were fighting, say, in Egypt or in the Middle East or India, perhaps. Now, in cold weather, a great coat was worn, but some units also wore goat skins, and they <laughs> called them smellies because they smelled really bad. And sometimes a leather jerkin was worn, like a vest. That made it easier to slide through the mud. And in the pockets of the tunic, the tunic had four pockets, and each soldier carried two wound dressings, one for bullets going in and one for bullets going out. They also carried a jackknife. Then over the tunic, a soldier wore, and the tunic is just like a coat, basically, a buttoned-up coat. Over the tunic, a soldier wore webbing. And this is kind of, this is unique to the British Army. The webbing uh, was kind of like an enhanced backpack. It, it was a backpack with wide straps that had a lot of compartments for putting things on. Uh, there is a video series by a fellow named Dan Snow. It was put out by the um, BBC, and you can go on YouTube and just Google Dan Snow, World War I soldier, and he actually puts on a complete uniform with all the gear and everything. They, the British called it the kit. Uh, the, the kit meant all of your equipment or gear together. But uh, the webbing, as I mentioned, had pouches for many things. They would, there were a lot of things they would put in there. I won't list everything, but of course, the major things included a canteen, ammunition, food, an entrenching tool. That was really important. That's like a little shovel, a mess kit, grenades, and a bayonet. And of course, there was a small backpack on the back with sleeping gear and other things. Maybe not that small <laughs> if you're carrying it around for hours and hours. But, uh, later in the war, soldiers carried a gas mask and. Uh, that's why they were required to shave every day. Although, interestingly enough, a couple of sources that I came across said that 
British soldiers at the beginning of the war were not just allowed, but required to have a mustache. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you are that. not a man at that time in the early 20th century if you do not have a well-groomed mustache. Yeah, so it's not like the Civil War where it was cool to have a beard. You know, Almost nobody had a beard, at least not in the British Army. Some of the people in the Eastern, like especially the Russians, would. And But yeah, you, you had to have a mustache if you could grow it. Now, they took that requirement away later uh, for the sake of the gas mask. But anyway, um, there were colonial soldiers. Uh, not all the people that fought for for Great Britain were actually from Great Britain. You had people from Canada, you had people from Australia, New Zealand. We'll talk a lot about those Australians and New Zealands when we get to Gallipoli, right, Scott? Oh, yeah. Yeah, they're going to have a big future here. <laughs> uh, you had also uh, soldiers from Africa. You had, uh, you know, like kind of like Moroccan people. You also had uh, people from sub-Saharan Africa. You had people from the Middle East. Uh, not so many because the Middle East are armies fought for the ottomans at least at the beginning some of them are going to break away later spoiler alert but uh, uh, a very short uh, sorry interjection is that yeah. camels are used as pack animals all over the north african front and other places mm-hmm. so that's a part mm-hmm. of the world war one story too yeah and, and a large number of indians are going to fight as well so they would have slight differences to the uniforms now the standard rifle the standard weapon was the Lee Enfield Mark 3 and this is considered by many if not most uh, authorities on this <laughs> this topic to be the best rifle on the western front. It used a bullet clip and was a bolt action. Okay? So to compare this with the Civil War rifles that we talked about a while back, the Civil War rifle was muzzle loading which meant you had to take the bullet and stick it in the muzzle that's the business end right that's where it fires <laughs> and you had to then ram it down you had to put powder in and then you had to put a percussion cap on and pull the trigger and it was just one shot and you had to do it again a a good mar- a good uh, soldier in the civil war could fire three or four rounds a minute and that's it uh, we've come a long way since then. This is breech loading and you had a clip, as I mentioned that, which would have five bullets. So you'd put the five bullet clip in there. You still fired it one at a time, but it was much quicker. You would just cock it with a little rod, which is off to the right. And that would use a bolt to force the chamber into the round and then you'd fire, uh, a good soldier could fire five to 10 I'm sorry, five to 20 rounds per minute. So way faster than the era of the Civil War. And bolt action rifles are going to be used by every side, although they'll all have their own type of rifle. They'll have different designs. But, you know, it's Scott, I'm not I am not much of a gun person. I mean, I I, I support gun rights. Don't get me wrong. But uh, but I, I've just not a I've never the only gun I've ever fired was a Civil War <laughs> replica. Oh, <laughs> yeah. When I've been looking at weapons for World War Two, there's whole YouTube channels of people who have uh, right. replica weapons of any war you could imagine. So, yeah. And that's what I was going to say is I, I wanted to learn about this stuff. So I started watching these things and I found myself like really engrossed in oh This is cool. You know, and there there's a. I don't know. There's like a video on every single, there's like an hour video you can watch on each individual rifle. So I, I, it's pretty amazing stuff what's out there. But, uh, so I learned a lot about rifles and weapons in general. Now, what about the food? What would a British soldier eat? Something disgusting and bland. Yeah, they were pretty well fed though, compared to some armies, but they would eat in general things like bacon, corned beef, cheese, vegetables, bread, and most importantly, two tablespoons of rum. Oh, sounds like the Royal Navy. Yeah, the daily rum ration was extremely important to these guys. Uh, so that's the British. Now we won't go into quite so much detail on the other nations, uh, but we'll, you know, as we go along, I'm going to spend a little bit less time on each one. But there's uh, there's a lot of similarity from nation to nation. All right, so that's the British. Shall we go on to the French now, Scott? Yeah, so I think that we're going from the British, who, like you said, have an early version of khaki or camouflage, and they're practical. The French are just as practical when it comes to their uniforms about battlefield safety and blending in, right? Oh, yeah, (laughs) right. Dan Carlin says that if you want to know what a Napoleonic soldier looked like, all you have to do is look at the French officers, I mean, not officers, all the soldiers at the beginning of <laughs> World War I because they were pretty much wearing the same thing. Yeah, the French were late to the game on uh, camouflage, basically. We talked about this in a previous episode. 
they wore a their their uniform was similar in make to the British uniform, but very different in color. They wore a bright blue tunic <laughs> and red trousers. I mean, like take a Union Civil War soldier and make him even more gaudy. Like because Union at least the Union soldiers wore sky blue trousers, but no, these guys wore red. They after one year of getting their <laughs> getting shot at and killed in, by the hundreds of thousands, they realized you know we better try something different. So they switched to horizon blue, which is kind of like a sky blue, much much better for <laughs> camouflage. No more bright red. Likewise with headgear, the initial headgear was a kepi, which was a soft cap. And again, it's similar to the uh, Civil War cap that was worn by the Union Army. In fact, that's where they got the idea from, from the French. But then they too switched to steel helmets in 1915. Their helmet was called the Adrian helmet. It was based on a fireman's helmet. Uh, not like the ones you would see today in the United States. You know, the, our fireman's helmets have these big, huge brims around them. They had much smaller brims. But in fact, they were the first ones to introduce the steel helmet. So even though they they were late to the party as far as camouflage, hey, they, they were first with the helmet. And the Adrian helmet was copied by the armies of several other nations. I should say the British one was too. Now, the gear was all in the knapsack or connected to the belt. They did not use webbing like the British soldiers did. And the food they ate was similar to that of the British soldiers, except, as you can guess, instead of rum, they drank, drum roll please, <laughs> wine. Thank you. Yes, surprise. Imagine that. Their most common rifle was the LaBelle 8mm, which was very long, very unwieldy, when the bayonet was fixed, the rifle was ridiculously long. It had this huge bayonet. It was taller than some people. The earlier versions could hold up to eight bullets, but they had to be loaded one at a time. So you didn't have that convenient clip like the British did. Later, they changed to a three-round clip and then a five-round clip. And they had a, a gun that was infamous. I, not, I started to say famous, but more like infamous. It was called the Show Show or show shat or different there's different pronunciations i've heard but it was a semi-automatic rifle but it had a bad tendency to jam and a lot of those ended up in american hands until they finally ditched them in favor of something a little bit better so that's the french and now we'll move over to the other side to the german any thoughts about the french scott well um this is an aside, but uh, with their rations, uh, throughout the 20th century, they were famous for having the finest cuisine in their rations. And even up into the 21st century, I remember reading a New York Times article that French MREs, when uh, French reserve forces would be in African nations like Mali or other places where they uh, typically go as foreign expeditionary forces, fetched a high price on the black market. So they were loved. And when American um, members of the Foreign Legion went to fight for the French, they were always fond of that. So that's one thing they got right, the food and the wine. Wherever you are in France, they get that. Hey, everyone. Scott here. We're going to take a very short break for a word from our sponsors. Once in a generation, a podcast comes along with the power and eloquence to inspire us all. This show will entertain you while you wait for that one. Join two best friends, author and former history teacher John Driver and comedian Johnny W. for hilarious and authentic conversations about life, history, culture, faith, and everything in between. You can listen to Talk About That wherever you find your podcasts or at lifeaudio.com. Are you concerned about tensions in the Middle East? Do you wonder where we're currently at in the biblical timeline? Are we really in the last days? Hi, everyone. I'm Dr. Carl Muller with the Inside the Epicenter podcast. Every week, my co-host, best-selling author Joel Rosenberg, and I answer those questions and more. You'll hear inside knowledge of our meetings with leaders at the highest levels of government in the U.S., Israel, and the Middle East, equipping you to filter the news with biblically sound insights. Find Inside the Epicenter on your favorite podcast app or go to joshuafund.com to listen and subscribe. Hello, this is Dr. Doug Grotheis, host of Truth Tribe, where we seek the truth through reason and evidence about what matters most. And we are not tribal since truth is for everyone. Please join me at the Truth Tribe as I discuss the reasons for Christian faith, the Christian worldview, and moral issues such as abortion and gender ideology. To listen now, go to lifeaudio.com or search Truth Tribe on your favorite podcast app. 
Well, I'm excited to look at the Germans because they're seen as the pinnacle of military efficiency. So let's get down to business. What are they up to? Yeah, these guys were had a reputation of being the most kick butt army and like a machine almost. And they looked like they looked the part. Their uniform was called Feldgrau or Field Gray. I mean, it was just gray and um, it was a good camouflage. The initial headgear was called the Picklehalbe. <laughs> the spiked helmet and the pickle means like a point or a spike. It doesn't mean pickle like a like a pickle cucumber. Uh, and these pickle halbe, that's they're iconic. They're famous. When if you think about a German soldier during World War One, you probably think about that spiked helmet. They were made of leather, boiled leather. But over time, as the British blockade, and more on that later, but as the British blockade led uh, tightened up things and cut down the supplies that the Germans were able to get. They had to give up on the leather, which was a good thing because then they went to the Stahlhelm or the uh, steel helmet. And that's the famous shaped steel helmet. And they, it's pretty much the same helmet that, with a few modifications that was used in World War II. Uh, I, I, I should say that as the leather was beginning to dry up, the, the leather supply, they tried to hang on to that pickle halba. They used felt, they used fiberboard, tin, sheet metal. And the pickle halba had camouflage covers to hide the brass on the helmet. But again, they eventually ditched that in favor of the gray steel helmet. Uh, that was in spring of 1916 when they made that switch over. And this was the best helmet of the war because it covered the entire skull, including the back of the neck. When they were not in combat, they wore soft felt caps. If you want to get a good idea of how they dressed and their equipment, uh, watch the movie – uh, all quiet on the Western front. Now there's two versions of that. There's the 1930 version, which won the best, best picture Oscar for that year. It's very good. I watched it recently. And then there's the 1979 version, which was made for TV and it's good too, but there's one major flaw with that movie, Scott. And that is that they got the uniform color wrong. <laughs> I mean, how could you, <laughs> the uniforms are not field gray. They're like this kind of greenish brown and so i just don't know how you could screw that up but anyway they watched okay, the original just, in black and white and they didn't bother to research the difference well, well yeah i don't know yeah, I don't, that's my well, best guess i don't know yeah, i have no idea but uh they got it right apparently in the black and white one because although it's hard to tell <laughs> but anyway so the gear was kind of like with the french uniform it was all in the knapsack or connected to the belts they also didn't use webbing that was kind of unique to the british their most common rifle was the Mauser Gewehr 98. That was a bolt action with a five round clip. And like the French label, it was very long. Now, food. At first, German soldiers were fed pretty well. They were fed as well as British and French soldiers. But as the war progressed, their rations decreased due to the British blockade. By 1918, most German soldiers were eating mainly turnip stew with turnip bread, and they did drink quite a bit of beer. That was their <laughs> drink of choice, of course. But uh, when you watch the movie and read the book, uh, uh, All Quiet on the Western Front, they talk a lot about having to eat sawdust. So, so yeah, they were very, very hungry by the end of the war. Uh, really, uh, it was tough to be a German soldier toward the end. All right, so that's Germany. All right, well, we can see that every nation is at least drinking to its culture, whether rum or wine or beer could probably guess uh, getting into the other nations what they'll drink, especially Russia. But let's look as we um, go down the power list of great powers. So who is next on the docket? All right. I'm going to switch it up a little here so we can leave the Ottomans for the last. Uh, Scott's going to fill us in some more about the Ottoman uh, army because he studied that quite a bit more than me. Uh, the Austrians, Austria-Hungary, their uniforms were similar to those of the Germans, not surprisingly their equipment as well, but there was a lot of variety. Hungarians wore a slightly different uniform. Going over to the east, the Russian soldiers wore a papaka, which was a tall gray or brown fleece cap with flaps of wool that could be folded down over the ears and neck. You will not be surprised to hear that they were the best at having cold weather gear because they were used to being very, very cold a lot of the time. Their tunics and pants were a greenish khaki they wore knee-length boots, but over time they were replaced later with ankle boots and puttees. It was just cheaper to not have to make all that leather. They also had a large greatcoat, and their bayonets always stayed on their rifles. 
And again, their their rifles were bolt action. All of them were bolt action. Most almost every soldier could fire, uh, you know, five, ten rounds at one time. Actually, the British. I, I didn't mention the British rifle. The the Lee Enfield could hold two clips of five, so they could fire ten shots before having to reload. And that's part of why they were so successful in some of the battles. Their riflemen were. Plus, they were very well trained. All right, now we'll move on to the Ottoman Empire. I'll set it up, and then we're going to hand it to Scott. Uh, the Ottoman army, as you can imagine, is going to be quite different from most of the other armies. They did base much of its uniform on German models, but they wore khaki, and they had a Bosch. How do you say that, Scott? Boschlik. Boschlik, thank you. I may have misspelled it in the notes. It was sort of a soft helmet. Later, some of them wore steel helmets, and their uniforms were, were not always the best quality, the standard rifles were Turkish Mausers, again, based on a German design. And then later they just used German rifles. And Scott, I'm going to hand it over to you. Yeah, so we'll get into them a lot more in a future episode on Gallipoli. But what James said there is that their uniforms and also their weapons are inspired by Germany. That's because Germany, since its unification, had heavily patronized the Ottoman Empire. It built its railroad line, um, which was publicly declared to be an infrastructure investment, but everyone knew that when you build transportation, whether it's Roman roads or American interstates in the 20th century, let's be honest, it's about moving troops. That's what big infrastructure, that's what big transportation programs are always about. So they had a veneer of Germanness, but there were always the distinct Ottoman mustaches that everyone had. Many people had mustaches at this time, but Turks have always taken mustaches to the next level. Officers of a certain rank, if we get off the battlefield and uh, look in ceremonial dress, they wore the fez, like you would see in Indiana Jones. Funnily enough, that is not an ancient thing. That was actually introduced as an innovation and a modernization thing in the 19th century as a way to promote equality, because that way you're wearing a fez and not everyone is wearing different turbans, which used to indicate your profession or class. And... Throughout the war, uh, the Ottoman army is constantly strained by lack of material goods and disorganized mo mobilization. The Ottomans, when they, they weren't too excited about entering World War I in the first place, but they were closely linked to the Germans. And I think the Germans hoped that they would build up the Ottoman Empire and they would serve as a deterrent to the Russians on the Eastern Front. That didn't happen for the Germans, and likewise for the Ottomans, they didn't get the supplies that they hoped they would from the Germans. Supplies really only began to come at the end of 1915. Um, a little bit about soldiers. Um, Ottoman soldiers were called Mehmetjik, which means little Mehmet. Mehmet is sort of a generic name for uh, in Turkey. Uh, and this is similar to the Doughboy in America, the Digger of New Zealand, or the Tommy in the uh, British. A lot of soldiers, uh, they came from rural or peasant backgrounds, and they had almost no formal education. Many of them couldn't read or write and may not have known much about the world beyond their nearest market town. Uh, there were over a million soldiers under arms from the Ottoman army, but the supply chain started to buckle very quickly uh, when demands were made on it. They did have a rail network, but it was absolutely primitive compared to anything in Europe, even compared to Russia. Uh, so it was difficult to move troops. It was difficult to keep them supplied when they got there. Oftentimes, railroads couldn't get them to their destination, so they would have to get off and march the rest of the way. So throughout the war, Ottoman soldiers are suffering shortages of ammunition and replacement weapons and equipment, even food. Probably one of the most poorly supplied armies in the entire war. They don't do well because of that, but they do have some surprise successes, which we'll look into. So though that is the Ottomans. Um James, tell us a bit about what is actually happening to the individual soldiers and what they're going through in the war. Right. So hopefully, uh, listener, now you have a pretty good idea of if you, if you were a World War I soldier, what you would be wearing, what you would be eating, what kind of gear you would be carrying. Uh, once you were dressed and equipped and trained and drilled, and, and I, I didn't even talk about training, Scott, but there was a wide variety of <laughs> training. You know, a lot, of the, a lot of the soldiers, especially at the beginning of the war, were were veteran soldiers, especially with the British. I know the Germans and the French had an extensive network of reserves and things like the National Guard. They may not have called it National Guard, but, the, but they weren't all like total rookies that were going out at the beginning. But that, of course, a lot of those guys are going to get killed and a lot of the replacements are going to be conscripts. Uh, 
or other people who just don't have a lot of experience and sometimes they didn't get a lot of training. You know, they had to get, they just wanted to get bodies out there as quickly as possible. And they didn't always, the, the bodies didn't always know how to use the gear. And so regardless of whether you were an old grizzled battle hardened veteran or a brand new green recruit, you were very, very likely to be wounded a lot. You know, I, I don't have an exact percentage, but a, a, I would say oh, the overwhelming majority of soldiers got some kind of wound, if not a fatal wound. So let's talk about deaths. Between 9 and 10 million total soldiers, all sides combined, were killed in World War I. 9 to 10 million. It's um, a huge number. Now, for most of the major powers, they lost between, let's say, 11 to about 18 percent of the soldiers that they mobilized. I'll just throw some numbers real quick. I always, when I do this kind of thing in my classes, Scott, I always say this is not on the test. <laughs> <laughs> so this is not on the test. Y'all, you can quit taking notes. But, but France lost about 16 percent of its army to death. That's death, not just casualties. But those 16 percent of French soldiers were killed. Britain was 12 percent, 19 percent in Germany. Russia lost, we don't know, their numbers are not as precise, 11 to 14 percent. Austria lost 18 percent. Turkey or the Ottomans lost 11 percent. But the Serbs get the prize, and that's not a good prize. It's not a prize you want. But the Serbs lost 37 percent of their soldiers. Ouch. Yeah, that's a function of the fact that they just get kept getting hammered by the Austrians. They kept fighting back, but eventually they just ran out of steam and were overwhelmed in their numbers. And they also had a very large number of soldiers die of disease. And the disease was a major part. All sides had people that suffered from disease too, but it, it, nothing like the Civil War, much less the Revolutionary War. We'll talk about medicine, medical care later. But uh, one thing that's interesting about World War I is that about half of the bodies of those who were killed were never found or identified. A lot of these ended up in mass graves. Many were too badly damaged to be identified. Some people, some soldiers were just literally blown to bits. And I, I hate to be gross or anything, but you couldn't even really find a body. All you could find were pieces and they'd be scattered all over the place. So there are many, many, you know, thousands, tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of soldiers that they just don't know what happened to them. Obviously they were killed, but they just didn't come back. Beside those killed, Another 13 million soldiers were wounded, and it's estimated that about 85% of battle wounds, 85% came from exploding artillery shells. That's that's just boggles the mind, not from rifle fire, uh, but from artillery. And wounds caused by exploding shells were vicious. They were often jagged. They became infected due to dirt and mud getting in them. They caused extensive damage to bone and muscles. And this problem was exacerbated in the Alps, uh, which we'll talk a little about the Italian-Austrian front, not too much. That's not going to be a major focus of the series. But suffice it to say for now that when Italy joins the war and fights against Austria, a lot of that combat is way up in the Alps, high, uh, high altitude fighting up in the snow and the mountains and they're very rocky. And so the, the, when the, they would fire artillery at each other, there would be a lot of fragments of rock that got in people's bodies. As I mentioned before, disease was common, and there was a very unique disease. I'm not saying it never happened anywhere but World War I, but it was kind of the signature disease of World War I. It was called trench foot, and this was deterioration and destruction of the capillaries, which led to the rotting of flesh. This was caused by people's feet just being constantly wet, just wet all the time. We'll talk more about this later, but the, the trenches tended to attract water and mud, and people would be up to their ankles, if not their knees sometimes, and, and it caused a lot of damage to people's feet. Uh, there was also trench fever. That was a form of typhus caused by lice, which were omnipresent. You, you read any book about World War I, and they'll talk about the lice. You know, they were just, the soldiers would try to get rid of them, and then they would finally just give up. But anyway, uh, some soldiers actually inflicted wounds on themselves. This happens in every war to some extent. But uh, it was pretty widespread in World War I. Sometimes they would expose themselves to frostbite. Sometimes they would shoot themselves, you know, like in a, 
arm or not, maybe not the arm, the hand or the foot, or they would inject themselves with toxins. Uh, that doesn't sound very smart, but, but they were desperate to get out of the, the hell hole that, that the front was. And then there was gas poisoning, gas poisoning, which we'll, we'll talk again more about that later, but gas poisoning affected about 1.2 million men. And this, they caused long-term damage to lungs and eyes. You were never the same after being gassed if you survived it. So that's a little bit about the, uh, the wounds, the different kinds of wounds that the soldiers uh, suffered. Hey, everyone. Scott here. One more brief word from our sponsors. Once in a generation, a podcast comes along with the power and eloquence to inspire us all. This show will entertain you while you wait for that one. Join two best friends, author and former history teacher John Driver and comedian Johnny W. for hilarious and authentic conversations about life, history, culture, faith, and everything in between. You can listen to Talk About That wherever you find your podcasts or at lifeaudio.com. Hello, this is Dr. Doug Grotheis, host of Truth Tribe, where we seek the truth through reason and evidence about what matters most. And we are not tribal since truth is for everyone. Please join me at the Truth Tribe as I discuss the reasons for Christian faith, the Christian worldview, and moral issues such as abortion and gender ideology. To listen now, go to lifeaudio.com or search Truth Tribe on your favorite podcast app. Are you concerned about tensions in the Middle East? Do you wonder where we're currently at in the biblical timeline? Are we really in the last days? Hi, everyone. I'm Dr. Carl Muller with the Inside the Epicenter podcast. Every week, my co-host, best-selling author Joel Rosenberg, and I answer those questions and more. You'll hear inside knowledge of our meetings with leaders at the highest levels of government in the U.S., Israel, and the Middle East, equipping you to filter the news with biblically sound insights. Find Inside the Epicenter on your favorite podcast app or go to joshuafund.com to listen and subscribe. Now, let's talk about how they tried to fix up those wounds, how they tried to heal them. Scott's going to take this this one for a while, and then we'll uh, I'll add a little bit more. Yeah, and believe it or not, it could have been a lot worse on the front. And that's because if you've listened to our previous series on the Civil War and the Revolutionary War, one of the most hellish scenes, I think, wasn't the battle itself. It was afterwards with hundreds or thousands of soldiers groaning in agony in the battlefield, and you would have to wait until your comrades would come and drag you off. You could be there for hours or even days. And thankfully, this starts to change in World War I. By World War II, you have combat medics. They're ready to run out to you with your stretcher, and they have a system. And it starts to develop here. I mean, this this wasn't a brand new idea because triage was used in the Napoleonic Corps. Stretchers made of wicker were used in medieval battles. And even in the Civil War, you see something like an ambulance. But by the time of the World War I, you do have properly trained medics that would rush on the field to help the wounded. Uh, they would come in the form of stretcher bearers. And we would call these people paramedics or combat medical technicians today. So they would find wounded soldiers, they would listen to their cries for help, typically, and carry them to safety. You had to be really strong to do this, and skilled in first aid, and brave because you're being fired at. They were going to the battlefield under heavy fire with no weapons, and they had to focus on finding the wounded instead of keeping themselves safe. Uh, so often, one of the first challenges of the stretcher bearer was getting the casualty they found to be quiet because they would be shouting for rescue. So they'd have to quiet them down and assess their wounds as they were carrying them back to safety. Uh, when they decided that a soldier could be loaded onto the stretcher and their wounds weren't too extensive, then they'd begin to move, uh, first to the aid post behind the front line and then to the field hospital. Uh, this was not easy because battlefields on the Western Front are jagged. They have heavy mud, they have shell holes, they have barbed wire. So very dangerous work, but saved many, many more casualties that would have happened otherwise. Right. Yeah. Um, so yeah, like as Scott said, when, when possible wounded would be carried off the battlefield by stretcher bearers to casualty clearing stations behind the front lines. If you watch the movie 1917, which just came out 
last year. I, we're re- well, we're recording this in 2020. It came out in 2019. Who knows when they'll be listening, Scott? Maybe somebody will listen to this in 2030, and they'll say, "Now ah, that came out 10 years ago." But uh, 1917 is a wonderful, outstanding movie on World War One, and they one of the many things that they show and they portray is a medical station, basically, where they were trying to heal as many people as they could. Some people would be operated on right there, just behind the front. Others would be evacuated to hospitals further behind the lines. Antiseptic care and anesthetics were greatly improved from 19th century military medicine, and blood transfusions were now possible. The host of the Great War YouTube channel that I referred to earlier, the host is named Indy Nidell. Indiana is his full name. That's pretty cool, but uh, but not Jones. But Indy says that between 1914 and 1918, medical care advanced more than in any other four-year period before or since. So I haven't in- independently confirmed that, but that there's a huge increase in medical knowledge and medical technology and medical practice during the war. So if you got wounded, you wanted it to be in 1918 rather than 1914, if you could help it. (laughs) Hygiene was really stressed. So gone are the days, like we talked about in our Civil War series, where, you know, they would have bloody instruments and they might wash them off, maybe in a tub that had a bunch of bloody water in it. And people would put knives in their mouths when they weren't using them and things like that. People didn't wash hands. That's gone. Delousing was done. Vaccinations were done. And among some armies, there was even medically supervised prostitution. (laughs) Yeah, the French and the British, not the Americans. Uh, They gave them cigarettes instead. (laughs) Now, if you lost a limb, and quite a few people did, prosthetics were commonly used as not just artificial arms and legs, I should say, but also noses and even face masks made of rubber or wax. A lot of soldiers suffered horrific injuries to their faces and they would just they they just looked really i don't know how to say it i I don't want to be ugly here but they just looked horrific and so they would wear these masks to so that they wouldn't scare and horrify other people scott did you want to say something well oh absolutely um well if if you want to get an idea of this if you've seen the hbo series boardwalk empire it's set in atlantic city in 1920 starting that's when it starts and there's one character who's a returning vet from world war one and half his face is blown off he has a rubber mask that covers half of his face and it's painted on the front to look like the other half of his face. So that could give you an idea of what that's like. Right. Yeah, that's a nice little detail that worked in there. Cosmetic surgery was nothing like today, but it was it advanced during the war. But some soldiers' faces could not be repaired in many states secluded. So that's wounds and medical care. We talked about physical damage, but what about psychological damage? This was a time when a lot of soldiers appeared to be perfectly fine on the outside, and yet they were not perfectly fine on the inside. So we're going to talk about that for a few minutes. Soldiers during the war became more and more disillusioned. They saw themselves as expendable. They suffered through battle after battle where it just seemed like they were just being thrown into the meat grinder, just run up there and mowed down by machine guns and artillery shells. And nearly half of all surviving soldiers experienced what they called at the time shell shock. Today, we would call it PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder, but they didn't quite understand that back then. They thought it was a physical condition caused by the impact of shells on the brain rather than a psychological reaction to just the absolute horror that they were in. And this is one of the tragedies of the war because commanders initially thought that soldiers with shell shock were just being cowardly or they were shirking their duty. Many were punished, and a few were even executed. It's really tragic that that armies on all sides executed their own soldiers for basically for having what we would say today would be PTSD. Really, really awful. Oh, yeah. And um, the other factor, too, is that there was, uh, strange as it sounds, some distrust between soldiers and doctors. Um, part of that has to do with because Doctors were medical officers and therefore senior in rank. And also they typically came from higher classes compared to your typical enlisted soldier. So as a result, soldiers from other ranks were usually hostile to medical officers and especially in cases of a neurosis, like what they called shell shock, because uh, 
neurologist or a psychiatrist or a doctor without specialist training, if they didn't understand what the soldier was suffering from, they thought, oh, just get back out there. You're rattled. You know, you don't have a problem. If they they could say that the soldier was being cowardly, they could withhold treatment rights, they could deny a pension or sanction disciplinary action. So for that reason, a lot of men in the trenches often try to avoid sending a mentally wounded man to see a doctor. So that just makes it worse. Right. Yeah. I mean, if you think about World War II, if you had the equivalent of PTSD, they called it battle fatigue or combat fatigue back then. You might get slapped, you know, especially if you served under Patton. Yeah. But at least at least you tended to not get shot. Like, well, may, maybe you, in some armies. I imagine the Germans probably did. Uh, but – uh, I mean, here, again, you could just get shot by a firing squad because you are suffering from PTSD. Some soldiers went as far as going going completely mad. Uh, I, I skipped something. I meant to mention that the tri- treatments were very primitive for people who had shell shock. They included shock therapy. That's 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 really great. You know, they're shocked. So we're going to shock them some more or, you know, counter shock them. Also, sometimes they would be uh, put into solitary confinement. Uh, sometimes officers would be sent to a kind of like they call them the loony bin, which is not very not a very nice way of saying it. But homes for those who were suffering from psychological disorders where they would try to heal them. Uh, and what about the research, Scott? Well, I mean, if there's a silver lining to all this, because so many soldiers who looked otherwise fine before the war started were ending up this way. It did cause some physicians to wonder if there was more to this than shell shock. So Charles McMorrin, who was later Lord McMorrin, a Ramon uh, physician who served in both world wars, said, can war make any man a coward in time? And so what he was trying to get at was that there was something wrong, but there's no obvious physical wound. And we're seeing too many cases of soldiers coming back like this. So what he concluded is that all men had a limited stock of courage and that men were out in war like clothes, but not everyone agreed with him. But this at least opened the door to what would later become an understanding of PTSD decades later. Yeah, and, and I want to give another shout out to another movie. We may have to reinstitute the movie drinking game. Uh, yeah, we're both doing it. It's good. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're going to both hit you. We're going to get movies from two sides here now. But there's a really good movie, which as of June 2020 is on Amazon Prime. If you have that, you can watch it for free. And it's called Regeneration. It came out in the late 90s. Uh, in the, in America, it was called Behind the Lines. But it's a movie about this very topic about specifically about officers, British officers who were suffering from psychological disorders and were put in one of these homes and they were being treated by doctors. What's interesting about the movie is they, they, well, what I was going to say is they, they show some of the primitive treatments. They show some shock therapy and things like that. But some of the characters are actual British soldiers who were also writers. Like one of the main characters is the famous poet Siegfried Sassoon. And then they had Robert Graves, who ended up writing the memoir, Goodbye to All That. I'm going to quote from that from time to time. And also Wilfred Owen, who was an up-and-coming poet who tragically was going to be killed in 1918 during the war. The other two that I mentioned survived. But that's kind of neat to see these actual writers in the, uh, in the movie. All right, so that's the, the psychological toll that World War I took on, on a, in, a, in a big nutshell. I mean, you could, you could do two or three whole episodes just on that. But, but we don't have time. We promise we're going to keep these episodes as short as we can and just give you the broad view. One other thing I wanted to talk about before we wrap up is capture and imprisonment. There, we've already seen how in, in a particular battle, you might have tens of thousands of prisoners captured, like at the Battle of Tannenberg. You know, I think 100, I said 150,000 Russians were captured or some number like that. Uh, huge numbers of prisoners. And over the course of the war, about 8.5 million men became prisoners of war. That's just a staggering number. That's about 10% of the total number of soldiers that served on all sides. What would happen to prisoners? Well, it, it depended on who captured them, and it depended on the circumstances at the time. Some were killed soon after capture. Others were kept in prison camps. And those who were kept in prison camps dealt with shame, just the shame of being captured, being not having done their duty to their country, they felt. 
they they dealt with squalor. The camps were dirty, nasty, filthy. They they were disease ridden. They dealt with hunger. You know, this is true in almost every war. Why feed prisoners when you can barely feed your own soldiers? So in a lot of cases, especially if you were in a German POW camp, you would you were not going to get a lot to eat. The International Red Cross and other organizations tried to relieve the suffering of prisoners, but they were very limited in what they could do. They just didn't have the resources. They didn't always have the permission to do the things they wanted to do. So that is uh, all I had to say. Scott, you want to add anything? I think that takes care of it. And uh, we gave you an overview. There's a few things in this episode that I think will make sense if we describe it in more detail, especially all the disease it's going around because you think, huh, you have lice on your body. Why not just avoid the water? Why not just wash? What's going on? Uh, Well, let me tell you something about the trenches, friends. It is not a pleasant place. And that is where our soldiers are camped out for much of the war. And it will all make a lot more sense. So in the next episode, we're going to be looking specifically at what it was like at life in the trenches. And Not very pleasant, but definitely worth getting into to really understand World War I. 